Today, we're going to be doing something a little bit differently. The other day, I made a tier list of World War I generals and streamed it live on Twitch. Go ahead and follow me if you want. It's The link is in the description, or you can just type it in Wolf of 1918. I ranked them based on the premise of who was the best general. And who the best general is depends on a couple of factors, mainly how they were able to understand the social and economic factors that plagued their nation, as well as the factors of military leadership and how to properly and tactically defeat the enemy. This was also based upon how they were able to learn from the war and adjust properly, as well as several other factors when it comes to military leadership, such as inspiration to the troops or understanding their lack thereof and adjusting for it. Some exterior factors did play a role in my judging of these people, such as in some examples, if they sided with the Nazis, that did put them a little bit lower, although it probably shouldn't have. I just can't necessarily rank someone who helped cooperate with the Nazis or literally created the stab in the back theory. I can't justify putting them higher than I already put them simply for those reasons alone. I understand disagreements with that, and I fully am okay with that. That is fully my opinion, and you have the right to yours, and I might be wrong in this instance. Now, in the description below are all of the generals that I ranked in no discernible order. Feel free to copy that link and comment with your thoughts on where they should be ranked on a tier list, and then compare and see if you either got it right or if you agree or disagree with me. I'm sure this is going to be a lot of fun and definitely no arguments or disagreements or any sort of controversy at all. Now, without further ado, ranking generals of World War I based on my opinions of them. There are a couple people in here who didn't really get a chance to fight much, but I will still be ranking them based off of their limited experiences. However unfair that might seem, I wanted to throw them in there because there are some very interesting figures throughout the war who I feel like don't get enough attention put to them because they're overshadowed by much bigger figures, specifically those of the German generals, the French generals, the British generals, and the one American general in the war. First off, we have Hindenburg. Uh, Hindenburg is an interesting person. He wasn't really too active in the military aspects of the German war effort. He did do some military commanding, but most of it was Ludendorff below him. And his whole thing was to be that persona, the face of the German military in the East, and eventually the face of the German military industrial complex. So he was someone who was able to add to what Ludendorff didn't have, which was charisma and this ability to look like this grandfather figure. He was very much to Germany what Joseph Joffrey was to France. And while he didn't really have a lot of experience, while he didn't, doesn't have a lot of a very big of a track record for military leadership during the First World War, even though Tannenberg is greatly attributed to him, it was really the design of someone else, I forget their name at the moment, but they're really only mentioned when talking about Tannenberg. It was really their, you know, creation. Hindenburg just gets the credit because of just timing. Uh, I would rate him, just because we are rating these guys as generals, Hindenburg isn't tested enough to know for sure if he was a good general or if he was simply someone who just happened to be riding on the coattails of Ludendorff and other people. So I can't properly rate him with confidence that I'm going to be right and that my opinion is correct to how his abilities were. But I feel like his post-war uh, record in terms of how he handled the state lands him, mixed with his lack of much doing in terms of during the war, lands him a solid spot at sea. He wasn't great, he wasn't bad, he just existed. His complacency with Hitler sort of lowers him down because he kind of bought into Hitler's facade. Um, next up, we have Pershing. Now, Pershing did have quite a bit of experience, and he was um, someone who we do have a track record for. 
He did butt heads with the French and the British a little bit, but overall he was able to find success in areas where other generals before him did not. And you can attribute it, this to multiple factors. He came in late to the war. Germany's manpower was drained because of the, the Spanish flu, uh, because of problems with manpower, because of revolution back home, because of lack of ammunition. Uh, supply lines were completely shattered, and they were already on the retreat. But Pershing didn't screw that up, so he's at least a decent general. Um, he was a good dude from what I've been able to, from what I've read. He wasn't someone who was, you know, a Nazi sympathizer, like quite a few people on the list, on this list were, or anti-Semite, like quite a few people on this list were. Um, so while I don't want to attribute, add personal values to how we rate someone as a general, it does interfere, and I'm going to be open and honest about that. But Pershing, I would say, gets a B rating simply because he didn't manage to screw that up. He understood the um, total ability, and there's actual evidence to his military capability. That's why I rate him above Hindenburg. Hindenburg doesn't necessarily have that track record that we can attribute to him, because he didn't really do anything militarily. He was more or less a statesman, um, and his military track record is very much so gray at best in terms of whether or not we can actually attribute anything to him, or if it was Hindenburg or some other general. So he gets a solid C. Up next on my list... We have Ludendorff. Now, Ludendorff was one of the people that I can attribute to having the most awareness as to how the war was going, what Germany needed to do to win, and what Germany's ability was to do those things, what the home front looked like, what the military situation looked like, and how to manage the eastern front and how to sort of manage the war. He was wrong on a couple things, such as the eastern East first policy. However, I doubt that they would have been able to win the war if they focused on the West as much as Ludendorff focused on the East. So he does get a grace in that aspect to where I don't think the war could have gone any better for Germany at the point in which he was able to take over and make that final decision as to whether or not focus on the East or focus on the West. When that debate was happening, it was already too late for Germany. Really couldn't have ended any better unless Germany got lucky in some sort of diplomatic maneuvering. But he understood Germany's condition, and he was able to enact policies that lowered the casualty rate of Germans on the Western Front from 75 Germans lost to every 100 British soldiers to about 55 Germans lost to every 100 British soldiers. He was able to enact policies that are still taught in military schools today, even though they might be slightly outdated, such as elastic defense policies, which was basically, don't stuff everybody on the front line, have a nice defensive, simple uh, front line that can people can retreat from, and then you can just shower the enemy in artillery in pre-designated locations with accuracy. He understood how the war was to be fought. He understood these things. He even understood that he was not very charismatic, and he had Hindenburg take care of that for him. So he was a very, very smart man. He understood how, to, how Germany need, could win the war. He didn't execute it properly, and things didn't line up, and Germany, of course, lost, but he understood these aspects of the conflict to a point where Germany had a very good shot at it. He is quoted as saying, at the outbreak of the Spring Offensive, that Germany cannot win the war, but they better hope not to lose it, which is basically saying that we can't, that Germany cannot win this conflict in terms of being able to accomplish what they want to accomplish from a perspective of victory in how people at the home front will see it. But they can't lose it, i.e. they need to save Germany from destruction. His track record after the war is um, terrible at best. He actively worked with Hitler. He is one of the perpetrators of the stab in the back theory, which Hitler bought into and which is kind of the founding cornerstone of the Holocaust. And uh, he completely danced around the ideas of military failure being the reason for Germany's defeat even though he himself said that was the reason in 1918 when he tried to sue for peace in September of 1918. So he was very wishy-washy and not a great guy. I can't, I can't ding him for that in terms of rating him, but it's important to know that he wasn't a good dude. Now, because of his failures in terms of uh, being a little bit hasty with with some things specifically re relating to the Western Front, and some of his policies being less than good on the Eastern Front, Uber Ust comes to mind, 
Uh, I have to rate him a little bit under S. Uh, he wasn't perfect. In fact, I don't know if I could rate any general here. No, there's a couple generals here that'll get the S. But yeah, he gets an A simply for the fact that he was able to understand so much so well. Up next is Kitchener. Now, this photo is terribly cropped, so I do apologize. Kitchener was this sort of... There's a Every nation had this Joseph Joffrey type of figure, and Kitchener was that for the British. He encapsulated this old British military thought in terms of how he looked, how he talked, and what his policies were. He was a great leader, and he was exactly what Britain needed at the time of the war happening. But much like Hindenburg, he wasn't very well tested on the field. There isn't a lot to say much for his... Uh, generalship for the First World War. He was a very good figure for the British people, and he was untested as the war went on, as he died pretty early on in the conflict. So there really isn't much to say for him in terms of how good he was as a general, but we can rate him pretty high simply due to what he was able to do for Britain and how he was able to sort of keep the British people in the war when things started to get dicey. Um... Unlike Hindenburg, he didn't get something given to him and credit given to him that wasn't undeserved, as far as I've been able to tell. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And so the thing that inspired the British people was of his own creation. So because of that, I will give him one tier higher than Hindenburg at a B. Um, just simply because of that fact alone. Up next is General Haig. Um, so... Haig gets a lot of hate for several reasons, and they can be very understandable reasons indeed. Just think about the things that he is known for, specifically the Somme and Passchendaele, some of the bloodiest battles of the war for the British. So he is, in many people's eyes, known as the Butcher, the Haig the Butcher. But... The psalm is one of those things that I can almost excuse from his repertoire. If I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm probably aware of that. But regardless, he he had this thought of the war as this, I, this war of attrition. And he understood that Britain and France could lose more men than the Germans could. And he was a firm believer that America would eventually side with the Entente. So he went out and launched offensives to whittle down the German manpower, specifically to make the war winnable. Now, it's debatable if his attacks actually did much in terms of ending the war sooner, ending the war in their favor, or doing anything other than just killing people. So you can call him what you want, but he had a very good understanding of the war overall, and he was able to give the Germans a run for their money when he needed to. He was... Ig if he was a terrible general, the British would have sacked him, and they kept him in place for a very, very long time. He was effectively the the what the British needed at the right moment. He was not a great general. He was no Ludendorff in terms of how he understood things, because Ludendorff was all about casualty prevention. Save as many men as you can for the offensives. Haig, well, not even just save as many men for the offensives, just save as many men as possible. That was Ludendorff's policy. Haig's was just kill the other people at no matter what cost to us because we have more men to lose. So simply for that aspect, he gets a B. He's not a, I, I don't think he was a terrible dude. He understood the aspects of the war and he understood the, he, he might have slightly misunderstood them, but he had a good enough grasp that that puts him better than most of the generals during the war. Uh, now on to Piton. So Piton, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. And I'm pretty sure if there's any French people watching, they're going to rip into me for pronouncing it wrong. But he was the French Ludendorff. I think that's the best way to describe him. He, he, he understood the war well. He understood the French situation very well. Unlike Ludendorff, he had charisma. And he was almost like a Napoleon without the little man syndrome. He was a very good general and kind of the savior of the French army during uh, Verdun. He was effectively the reason why the French didn't completely collapse during Verdun. And one of the main reasons why the French stayed in the war. And he was one of the leading reasons why 
the, the mutinies were able to get stopped. He understood the French military condition, even if he didn't have the power to fix it. So for that, I give him an A. His military track record, like some of the people on this list, isn't very strong to put him there, but his understanding of the personnel and of how to fight the war and the fact that he was able to properly execute that puts him at an A. Uh, the only reason why he is an S tier, much like Ludendorff, is his compliance with the Nazis later on. Uh, next up, uh, we have Enver Pasha. This was a Tur he was a Turkish general, and if you've, you're a fan of the Great War series on uh, YouTube, you will know that he um, was, well, not a great guy in terms of how he handled the war. Also, I'm going to go ahead and pause, and I want to say thank you to my two new followers, Tactical Chungus and Sir Zapier. I appreciate it, guys. You, you rock. Um, but back on to the... Um, the, the list. Enver Pasha was uh, probably one of the worst generals of the war. Not the, not the worst. One of the worst. He effectively destroyed the entire Turkish army from the onset. He dragged Turkey, or the Ottoman Empire, into the war, and into a war that they really couldn't win. And he continued to make mistake after mistake until the and and, t, and the Ottomans just wouldn't sack him. So he gets an F. He just wasn't a great dude. He thought really highly of himself, and any German officer who worked with him had nothing but bad things to say. There's not much else to say than that. He was a butcher. He was he was what people might accuse Haig of being, but he actually was those things. Um, now we have Ferdinand Foch. Um, much like Patton, he understood the war extremely well. He understood the French people, the French military, and what the French needed to do to win. And especially what the French military needed to do simply to stay alive. One thing that he gets quoted often in saying, and what people like to point out about him, is that he also understood the problems with the Treaty of Versailles. Specifically the idea that the Treaty of Versailles was merely a temporary armistice rather than a permanent fix on uh, stopping future war. Uh, and simply because of that, he is regarded as someone who was very understanding in means of diplomacy and how to properly um, go about preventing future wars and how basically these societies work and how diplomacy works and just... How, basically how the machine of Europe operates. He was very well aware of how the machine of Europe operated back in the day. He understood that by doing that to Germany, it was much like what Germany did to France, but worse, in that at some point, not necessarily because of the Treaty of Versailles, because of what it did, but because, well, kind of because of what it did, but because of the way that the peace was written, it was too harsh to give the Germans a sense of pride, in what they did, and, and left them with this bitter taste in their mouth that they would want to take revenge at some point, or that at least there would be enough people wanting to take revenge. But it wasn't harsh enough to stop Germany from rebuilding. And he understood that. Um, so I would put him up at, at, at A, along with Patton and Ludendorff. Um, he doesn't have as good of a track record as Patton or Ludendorff in terms of his overall military command, and I put that more on to, onto his inability to really, you know, he was a great organizer. In fact, hmm, I'd say he's S tier, specifically because of just the, the way that he was able to handle the overall um, situation in the war. And the fact that even post, you know, he didn't live long enough to go into the Nazi era, so it's hard to say if he would have collaborated with the Nazis like Patton. I doubt he would have due to just his personality, but, you know, it is what it is. Now let's go on to, you know, probably going to get some hate for that as well, just because there's some characters that people might... Um, you know, a lot of World War One generals get a lot of hate that they don't deserve. Um, so... There's that. Now, Moltke the Younger, i.e. the person who gets blamed for the failure of the Schlieffen Plan. I'm going to say it right now. He was B. 
He was he was a pretty good general. There's not a lot of bad generals on this list so far, which is probably surprising a lot of people um, about that because because of the absolute failure of um, the Schlieffen plan, specifically how badly it um, it failed, and in terms of the uh, long term effects of uh, the overall problems that it had on the German army. But Moltke was stuck with a plan that he couldn't throw out. This is because the German military commanders, specifically those who had slightly more power than him, liked it so much that they didn't want to get rid of They thought it was the end-all plan. Moltke wasn't a big fan. He saw the flaws in it, and him and several other people, specifically him and Ludendorff, worked on trying to figure out a way to make it better. And Moltke came up with this idea to that because they would not have enough men to properly go around the French army and encircle Paris, to rather bypass Paris and make the entire plan to encircle the French army and destroy it which is what the German army ended up doing. A lot of people will say that, oh, the Schlieffen plan failed because they took tight, too tight of a turn. That was the entire plan because the German army didn't have enough manpower to pull off the maneuver Schlieffen had in mind. Schlieffen was aware of that too. In fact, some people might even say that Schlieffen's plan was a was sort of a pipe dream, and he was aware of it, and he only made it as sort of a, if Germany has the manpower to do so. And then other generals took it and ran with it, and Molka got stuck with the bill. So he understood that there was a problem with it, and the way that the Germans executed it was about as good as it could have gone with the British getting involved. If the British didn't get involved, the plan would have probably worked to its fullest. But the British got involved, and we ended up having trench warfare for, for almost five years. So there you have it. Moltke was a B-tier general. He just he made several key mistakes, and he wasn't able to handle the stress of watching the war de- devolve into what it was, and he blamed himself for it. So, because of those several key problems, and because um, he just wasn't able to hold himself together or really adapt to the changes in his plan, he gets a B tier. Although he is as high as he is because he understood the flaws in the plan and made adjustments to it that almost worked. Whereas the original plan would have seen the complete destruction of the German army from the onset. Anyway, um, let's go on to everyone's favorite general of the war. Well, I shouldn't say everyone's favorite general of the war. One of the most infamous um, generals of the war, if you kind of understand uh, World War One. I. I shouldn't even say if you kind of understand it. If you've looked into specifically Italy, so you guys can already kind of see where this is going, uh, Luigi Cadorna. This dude loved the Ansonzo River. He was a big fan of it. He decided to have 12 whole battles next to the Ansonzo River. He somehow could not understand the fact that, um, well, you know, if, if it's not working, go, go somewhere else, right? He couldn't understand that his... Let me put it this way. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. Luigi Cadorna did just that. He didn't adjust. They didn't change things. They simply sent, he simply sent, an entire generation of Italians to go die across the same damn river a dozen times. He does not even deserve a place on this list, but we'll put him at F. Up next, we have the French equivalent in uh, Nivelle. Nivelle is someone who was given the credit for Verdun and for the success at Verdun and the French ability to hold it, even though he simply took what Patton had made and ran with it. So he got all the credit. And when Joseph Joffrey got replaced by being promoted into an office where he couldn't do anything... They needed to replace him. And it was between Nivelle, who was very popular amongst the politicians, Petain, and Ferdinand Foch. So, of course, Nivelle wins. 
Specifically because he talks about this grand plan to win the war in 48 hours, and he'll only say it if he gets the position. So they give him the position, and he says, I have this plan, this offensive plan. And the French are immediately like, no, 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 monsieur. We have done that. Bad idea. And he's like, no, but see, it's, it's good because if it doesn't work within the first 48 hours, I'll call it off. And they're, they just say, well, okay then. That sounds great. And then the Germans, and, and so his plan heavily relies on mapping the area where the Germans are and pinpointing weak spots and exploiting those weak spots and basically using those to roll up flanks and then exploit a big hole. Basically a more thought-out version of the Battle of the Somme and a more thought-out version of Passchendaele. The problem was, is literally weeks before they do the offensive, not even that, the Germans retreat to the Hindenburg Line. And so, the, and so everyone's telling him, look, 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 we can just replan it and we'll do it later. But he is so stubborn that he still goes on with the offensive and the French army gets destroyed. So badly damaged that the British have to hasten their launching of the offensive of Passchendaele in bad weather simply to relieve the French pressure so that the French army doesn't completely collapse. His terrible offensive. And then, and then the 48 hours go over. This is before the Battle of Passchendaele. The 48 hours end, and they tell him to stop because they haven't gone anywhere. And he says, no, the Germans are just about to break. And he, they keep throwing men and men, men into the meat grinder. And the French mili- uh, government keeps begging him to stop, but he just keeps convincing him to let him go a little bit longer to where the British have to launch a hasty version of Passchendaele, which ends up being the Battle of Passchendaele in poor weather. And the French army gets so bloodied that they mutiny. And it's only because of Patton and Ferdinand Foch that the mutinies are able to stop and it doesn't result in a complete collapse of the French army and a complete collapse of France. So because he literally nearly destroyed the entire French army and the entire nation of France and sent so many French men to die for nothing, he is literally on the level of Luigi Cordona, if not just a little better. Cordona was only replaced when the Italian army was getting completely destroyed by the Austrians during their offensive. Let's go on to the first Russian general of the list, Brusilov. I'm just going to say it, he's A-tier, easily. He understood the German, the, the Russian condition on the Eastern Front near perfectly. He understood what the Russians needed to do to secure victory, and he launched an offensive so violent and so successful, it effectively destroyed the Austrian ability to win the war. It crippled the Austrian army. Even though Russia lost the war, the Entente was more than likely able to secure victory because Brusilov completely destroyed the Austrian ability to fight. I'm not saying that's the only reason why they won, but I'm saying that without that happening, I don't think that the Allies would have had an easy time winning the war um, in 1918. I don't think the Germans would have just completely collapsed. I don't think the Austrians would have just completely collapsed. I think it would have gone longer if the Allies even win. So his offensive effectively really helped. It was exactly what Haig wanted his offensives to be. A crippling blow that boosts morale and completely annihilates whole portions of the enemy army. And because of that, he gets A. I'd put him at S, but he he wasn't able to continue going forward with that. And I kind of blame that on the Russian Revolution and the Russians' inability to... their morale collapsing because they didn't feel like fighting anymore. But... Yeah, that's that's where I place Brusilov. Now for uh, everybody's favorite British general, John French. Ironically named, because he is a British general and he hated the French. You can kind of already see where this is going. He was the general of the British forces for, I think, the first year of the war, and he continually disregarded orders to work with the French. He, after the initial pushback by the Germans, demanded to allow, demanded that his entire military be evacuated from France, and resisted the orders to go off and help the French plug the gaps on the Marne. He just didn't want to work with the French. He didn't want to have his army die in France. He didn't like the fact that he had to go command the troops in France and that the troops were getting sent to France. He didn't like the fact Britain was, you know, doing anything in terms of sending troops on the ground. He wanted to fight Germany. He just didn't want to fight Germany in France. John French was... Militarily, he was pretty good at what he was doing in terms of how he was able to command troops and how they were able to fight. The British were, you know, the British professional army was historically good 
in terms of their tactical prowess and their ability to fight in the early war. And a lot of that has to do with John French. He was very good at commanding troops. He just didn't understand the war. He didn't understand the strategic position and that he needed to put his pride aside in order to see victory. So because of that, I'm putting him with, uh, I would say, below Hindenburg. Because even though he was really good tactically, his his strategic prowess, which you need in a general, was so limited that he didn't get it. And it almost cost the Allies the war. So he doesn't um, believe... I, I, he doesn't deserve to be higher than a D. He's not F tier because he didn't waste lives, but he's not any higher than D because he almost lost the war for his nation simply because of his arrogance. Um, and Armadillo John French, I highly recommend looking into him. He was the original general of the British forces, and he was pretty bad at what he did in terms of the strategic ability, like I was saying. Up next is... One of my lesser favorites of the German generals, um, Eric von Falkenhayn. Um, but he isn't... So Falkenhayn's an interesting character. Um, this dude was... Um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? He was a good general, but he had his major faults. I'm going to go ahead and just put him in B tier, just below Ludendorff. Um, Falkenhayn had one major, has one major taint on his record, has one major stain, and that's for Dunn. And based, no, not even that. It's literally his policies during 1916. His policy to counterattack. Anytime the Germans lost ground during the Somme without hesitation caused so many casualties that it was really just a waste of life. When the German army could have just pulled back to other positions and pulled back taking limited casualties and inflicting heavy casualties against the British because they had land to lose, he instead ordered the Germans to just counterattack at every opportunity. In Verdun, he launched an offensive on forts and continued to send men into the meat grinder when they weren't making any ground. He did learn from his mistakes, and he was extremely successful in Romania when he was allowed to operate in open land. So he was a good general at certain points, and he understood several aspects of what Germany needed to do to win. Specifically, that Germany needed to take France out of the war. If France was out of the war, the entire British army on the continent could get surrounded and taken out, and the British, without an army, would more than likely sue for peace. So he understood that aspect. He dis- And... Um, he understood these aspects of the war that really take a really good general to understand and be able to apply. And he was able to do that. But his stains in 1916 put him at a B-tier general. On top of that, he was supposedly, according to people who knew him, he died early on. I think he died in 1920. Um, but supposedly, he was a very good person. He was a very nice person. Uh, and he didn't buy into a lot of the stab in the back theories. Um, he did have some time in Palestine, and he actually prevented several um, s- several mass killings of Jews while he was there. So he was a very, very good person in terms of his personality, from what we know of him, but he wasn't the best general. I put him at B tier simply because of 1916. If he handled 1916 better... I'd probably put him at an A tier. Now on to Joseph Joffrey, the person I keep comparing a bunch of the other people to, um, but nonetheless, someone that deserves to be mentioned. Joseph Joffrey is effectively given the term Savior of the Psalm, even though that was technically another general, so very much like Hindenburg, given credit where it wasn't necessarily him, although he did play a big role in the Miracle on the Marne, rather than Hindenburg and Tannenberg. I would put him at, at a B. He did get um, promoted up away from commanding the military because he was making some pretty big errors. Like, he was really good in 1914. By 1916, he was making such critical errors in terms of military strategy that it was clear that he hadn't learned the lessons that he should have learned by that time. But he was still like this this figure that understood French society in terms of what he needed to do in order to keep the societal aspect intact and the industrial aspect. Militarily, he wasn't learning 
what he should have been learning. So he, I can't put him above B for that reason alone. As much as I want to, because he was really good in the opening stages of the war, I just, I, I just can't. I can't. For anyone who is a Joseph Joffrey fan, I apologize I can't put him higher. It's just, I, I can't do it with a good conscience. Up next, we have Hotzendorf. Uh, yes, Conrad von Hotzendorf. Uh, yeah. One of the people who started the First World War, dragged basically dragged Austria into it, had requested Austria go to war with Serbia like once a month up until the war started. Uh, the dude was an idiot. He did over... Um, he was overzealous in engagement specifically to try to win over an already married woman. And uh, I'd say he contends with uh, Luigi Cordello for one of, Cordon, Cordona for one of the dumbest generals of the First World War. In fact, they basically competed against each other on the Italian front for who could be dumber. And so he goes there. This dude was so dumb, he literally made it so... So, okay, you are fighting the Italians. They've been pushed back, and you know all you need to do is strike one more blow. You no longer have to deal with Serbia. You no longer have to deal with Russia. Who do you send to fight the Italians? Easy. Find the people who are loyal to your country. Right? Get a lot of Austrians there. Keep, you know, other people low. No, what, what Hossendorf does is he literally takes Italians in the Austrian army and Hungarians who are under unrest and almost no Austrians and launches an offensive with that. Yeah, the entire Austrian army was completely destroyed because you had everyone who was unhappy with the Austrian army in Austria in general, getting sent against the Italians when, um, well, the Austrians weren't really engaged. So he effectively lost the war for the Austrians. He started, though. He, he was one of the main proponents of starting the war. So he gets the F tier. He killed people for no reason. He sent people to die for... He, he killed a generation of Austrians in useless fighting. His, his actions in Privysville, which is where he gets most of his hate, are more justified. But he never learned, and he continued to make mistakes throughout the war. And he was never sacked, because Austria was just that incompetent. <clears throat> All right. So we're almost done, and we've only really got one S tier, couple, one C, one D. Uh, mostly B tier generals, which is what I was kind of expecting with this. But now we go on to Mackensen. This dude is easily S tier. Now, he did have the anti-Semitism after the war. But he didn't like Hitler. So, um, I, I would say he's... The reason why Ludendorff is A-tier is because he made several key mistakes that, um, throughout the war, specifically his choice of Eastern Front first, that don't put him to S-tier. Mackensen was just a very good general in terms of understanding what he needed to do. He wasn't at the higher echelons as Ludendorff was, but he was very, very good at fighting the war and accomplishing what he needed to accomplish for his nation. Um, his anti-Semitism aside, his terrible personality aside, he is an S-tier general. Now up for Nicholas II. He is the only leader on this list, the only person who led their nation and was technically a general at the same time. I'm going to put him in D-tier. He cared about his troops, and he tried to not send them into slaughters. He really attempted to win the war for Russia. Unfortunately, he just didn't understand how the military worked. He didn't understand how the home front worked, and it just ended up collapsing. He had very good intentions, and he did have several key successes. The dude understood that going to the front lines, however dangerous that, meant, that was, meant that the troops would be inspired, and he did that multiple times, risking apologies. He did that multiple times, risking his life, inspire troops. For that reason alone, he's not F-tier. F-tier is willingly sending men to die for no reason. D-tier is just... You have some positives, but it's mostly negative. And he effectively caused his nation to collapse. Um, so, D-tier for him. Next up. Leto... V no, sorry. Von Leto Vorbeck. His name always tricks me up. Another S-tier general, the way that he was able to handle German East Africa, the way that he was able to carry on guerrilla warfa warfare, is still studied to this day. He was one of the last generals to... I think he was the last central power general to surrender, um, and he just completely held out. 
it's it's fa- I was actually talking a little bit about this with uh, with with Matt uh, in the live stream the other day. If you guys haven't seen that, I highly recommend checking it out. Go to uh, my channel to check it out. Whether or not he'd be a good general in terms of commanding on the Western Front, we will never know. But he was extremely good at what he did in Africa. He is easily an S tier, um, and he was able to perfectly handle. Um, the war there and accomplish his goals and effectively tied down so many British troops down there that you could argue it prolonged the war. It just makes me wonder how much more successful would he have been if the Germans were able to actually get that Zeppelin filled with supplies to East Africa instead of turning around and landing it because they got a false report he had surrendered. Um, The other thing that is interesting is that he literally told Hitler to go F himself. Um... Although there are reports of him being anti-Semitic, there isn't anything concrete. So, very much so product of his time, but I would put him more on the level of Falkenhayn in terms of how he treated people and how progressive he was. He he literally commanded um, colonial troops and was very popular amongst them, which means troops that are mostly not German. So the fact that he was able to do that and be popular, unlike his contemporary in German West Africa, you know, the dude who committed the genocide, I'd say he was a very good person as well, if not having some flaws. All right. Easy, another easy decision here, Lawrence of Arabia, S tier. I would say that Lawrence of Arabia's actions in the desert made him, made the Ottoman Empire collapse much quicker than it otherwise would have. His actions there and his ability to fight and unite uh, the Arab um, tribes basically created such a big problem for the Ottomans that they weren't able to successfully exploit their victories in the desert against the British. They weren't able to push forward in, uh, in their, on the Russian front. They weren't able to send as many troops to the east. They weren't able to really support the central powers. Instead... Um, they had to tie down more troops trying to fight Lawrence of Arabia's uh, insurgents. So he was a very important aspect of that. He was backstabbed by the British with this Sykes-Picot agreement, and so as were all the Arab rebels who thought that they were going to be able to choose how they lived. You know, these rebels were of different tribes and wanted to start their own nations, but they were working together for a common goal, and they were completely backstabbed and thrown to the side by the by the British. So, he gets... Lawrence of Arabia gets an S tier, just because of what he was able to do. He published several books about his experiences and about his backstabbings, and I highly recommend them. On to something that I haven't touched yet. A Belgian general. By the name, and I'm going to screw up this name, so I apologize to any Belgian people watching. Gerard Lemon. Lemon, I should say. Not Lemon, Lemon. This dude was kind of a chad. He was one of the commanders in one of the fortresses of Liege, I think, or Antwerp. One of those two cities. One of the main fortresses that were tied. I think it's Liege, the, the one where Ludendorff charged the, uh, the positions and made the city surrender um, single handedly. Or with a small amount of troops falling. But I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about uh, Le Mans. Uh, so this dude was the commander of one of the forts. And he stood his ground to the last and was literally rescued from the rubble by German soldiers unconscious. He was captured and taken to a POW camp and wanted to insisted that the Germans list him as captured rather than surrendered because he was captured unconscious he did not surrender to the to the germans and because of his you know his staunch um and stubborn fight against innumerable odds against the germans and the fact that he was able to inspire his forces to continue to fight against um this oncoming gray wave the Germans had a lot of respect to him. Where when he left, because he got he got ill towards the end of the war, so the Germans allowed him to leave to Switzerland to be treated properly, and they let him leave with his sword, which 
is not something that really happens. You do not get to take your weapon. But because they respected him so much, they gave him their sword. Uh, he would go back to Belgium after the war, be celebrated as a hero, be given medals and all these other accolades, and he would die, I think, in 1920 at the age of 69. So you know that this dude was just a chad. He was, he was left and right being just absolute just chad energy. Definitely an A-tier general. Just right there. Up next, we have Louis Bernheim. Um, another name that I'm probably going off and butchering. This guy was another Belgian general. He was... Again, Belgian generals didn't get a lot of experience, so I'm basing this off of a very limited time frame that we have of them and very limited information we have about them. Whereas with Hindenburg um, and Joseph Joffrey, we have a lot of information about them available, and they were these big figures, and people love to overrate them and put so many accolades on them and worship them sometimes, and yet we don't really have much to go off as to what they did, whereas with Ger Gerard Le Lemon and Louis Bernheim, we literally only have their major accomplishments. So based off their major accomplishments or major failures, which is all we have of them, we can only assume that that's a showing of their ability to um, fight and be a general. So Louis was very successful in terms of his ability to... Oh, that's not where I want to put him. I guess I'm going to do this. Um, but Louis was very good at what he did in terms of what he had available to him. He didn't really lose battles. He was able to stop the German advance. He was able to push forward when asked by the uh, British. And he played a large role in 1918 in pushing the Germans out of Belgium. He won multiple medals for bravery, including the uh, Pour le Merit. I think that's what it's called. Um, and several other Belgian medals. Like, basically the highest honors of France and, and Belgium. Um, if I'm recalling that correctly. Uh, let me just double-check something real quick. I want to make sure that I'm giving you guys accurate information. The Légion d'Honneur. Pour le Merit is the German award. That's why it didn't sit with me well. I was like, I'm saying something wrong. I know it. So that's why. Um, it is So the Légion of Honor, de Honor is the highest French order of merit, as you can see on the screen here. Um, for So he wasn't... I, I would say he was a, a pretty pretty good general. I, I would I would put him up at, at A tier easily. Because simply because of his reputation and the fact that France was like, yeah, he's so good we're gonna give him our highest military award. Granted I'm pretty sure that award was also given to a pigeon, but um, I'm not going to talk about that right now. <laughs> Uh, so all that is done. Um, that is the tier list. If you disagree, man, that sucks. But uh, that's what I've got. Thank you guys for watching. I can't wait to go ahead and see the comments, the angry and happy comments I get, as well as those disagreeing with me. This is definitely an opinionated video and not one necessarily based on the facts of history or what actually happened, and very much so my opinion of where I should rank them based on what I know about them. So please do leave your comments in the uh, comment section below, obviously, with your opinions on why I'm wrong, because I know for a fact that I didn't make everybody happy, and I'm pretty sure most of you have some contention with where I put people. If you guys want to support what I do, merely leaving a like and subscribing would be a huge help. Honestly, it does keep me motivated to make future videos. But if you want to go further than that, you can stay connected with the community by joining the Discord server or going and checking out my little Teespring shop with some mugs, posters, and whatnot, which is also linked in the description below with everything else. I do have an Instagram, which is a good way to reach out to me and just keep up with my posts and my content as well. Again, if you guys want to stay connected with the community, there are a ton of links in the description that will shoot you to different areas and keep you connected within the community that is slowly growing. Uh, it's been great to see on the Discord server because there's a lot of people who are very well versed in history and certain aspects of history. 
And some of them know a lot about different aspects of history that I just don't know a lot about. It's a great pool of knowledge that you can really ask around. And if you have questions about a certain event or you want to know more and know where to find books or just get knowledge about something, it is a great place to go and just get involved and ask questions, whether that's for reenactment, history, even sports for some reason, that's a thing in the server. But you can definitely go there and get connected and be involved. It's honestly a really cool place and I couldn't have asked for a better community. So thank you guys for supporting my channel and I do hope you guys enjoyed. More content coming soon. Auf Wiedersehen und tschüss, mein Kameraden.